Welcome to Black Art Story Month and Black Future Month. My name is Matilda Cheatham from the World Beat Cultural Center. Back on again. <laughs> we'll try to rewind. Come again. Um, I'm writing a grant right now. Grants is due right now. So, you know, we're going crazy. Grant writers trying to call and everything. So, 
again, welcome to Black Our Story Month and Black Future Month. I'm Akita Dred Cheatham, uh, the executive director and founder of the World Beat Cultural Center. And I'm so happy you're here because I always love Black scientists and African scientists. So we have the one and only, uh, our resident anthropologist, uh, historian, Arthur, researcher, Dr. Renoko Rashidi. And doctor, how many books have you written? I, I named, you know, I was reading your biography and I, and I named a few, you know, like, I don't know, 15 and you had more. I think 22 and I'm working on two or three more. I could easily write 15 more books, easy. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And how many countries have you traveled? <laughs> I seem to be a little confused about that. Somewhere between, as I count it, 122 and 125. That's incredible. What, what country, uh, what African country that you felt you resonated with? Oh, I don't know, sis. Every country has its own unique flavor. I love Egypt because of the monuments, the antiquities. I love that. I love Ghana because I feel like I've been there before. I love really? Uganda because of the wonderful people there. And Rwanda is very similar. So every region has its own character. What I wish is that every African in the diaspora as a result of enslavement could go to Africa just at least once in their lifetimes, wherever you go, Somalia, Senegal, South Africa, Cairo, and just stand on African soil. It's transformative. We have to. And thank you for going to Peru with me last year. It's you been know, a year. Sis, yeah, it's been a year. I get a lot of credit. But you know, the bottom line for me is I'm really doing something that I enjoy. Yes, yeah, a lot of work, but I enjoy it. And to me, to be able to find something when I was young in life and pursue it, my thing in life. It's really wonderful and you feel blessed and I feel blessed every day. And I'm blessed to be on your show and looking at your beautiful face. How can I not be in good spirits? And tonight we're gonna look at a different theme in our history. And that is a history of African people in science, Africans and African-Americans. So I'm glad to be back. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And uh, this is part one and we're gonna, <laughs> Saturday we'll go into African Americans in science. So we're gonna have yeah. fun. And also we recorded, uh, it's dedicated to George Washington Carver Good. and we recorded uh, great jazz musicians that played with McCoy Tyner, Chico Freeman, and, and they're going to play a song called Plant Whispers. And it's with our plant and our research, you know, we're with uh, the National uh, science but you know it's that's going to be for us to be researchers with the national science foundation and then playing plant music and doing science so our kids can know that black people could be in science and in a stem program so here we go doc all right let's let's uh show some photos and see how it goes here we go you all need to make me a host all right. And I'll pull some pictures up and we'll sit by the fire and kick it around. Almost right. there. It's been an interesting week. Now, this is the third different presentation I've done this week. Really? I did on Monday, a general one called On the Shoulders of Giants. That was nice. An interview and then a kind of a global journey through the African presence in Asia and ancient America. And then today, in fact, it was today, I repeated it twice. I did one called The Door of No Return, and it was grim. And I looked at the at these places of horror and these places of memory where our ancestors were kept before they were put on the floating coffins. And now, oh. Africans in science. <laughs> so let's see how it goes. Let's, let's, see. let's go for it. Thank you. Here we go, right on right. time. Now. It's another distinguished African woman. You know, I love black women. 
and she <laughs> kind of says it all. When I do these presentations, I try to have ancestral guides to walk me through. I'm inspired by our ancestors. And here, my Angelo said, and this summarizes it, the more you know of your history, the more liberated you are. Hey, simple, profound. The more you know of your history, the more liberated you are. And then here, of course, is what we're going to do tonight. Now, we're going to divide it up. Tonight, we're going to mostly go through Africa, largely now Valley contributions to science and technology. And then on Saturday, the second part of the presentation, we'll look specifically at the African American at African American contributions to science and technology. So we're not going to start with hidden figures tonight, but we're definitely going to touch on that phase of our history come Saturday, God willing. Now, I always, well, I won't say always, but I use this a whole lot because I think it pretty much tells us, it's hey, it tells the story. I'm going to tell my children their story does not begin with slavery. Very, very fundamental. That's one of the flaws, and I see it every year with Black History Month, is that a lot of us tend to start with the enslavement period. John Henry Clark, the great scholar, used to say, if you start with slavery, you will think the best, you will, how did he put it? If you begin your history with slavery, you will think everything that has happened since then is progress. So we're not gonna start at the end, we're gonna start at the beginning with the maxim, the African proverb goes, if you know your, if you know the beginning well, the ending will not trouble you. So let's go to the beginning. And then we have, yeah, I wanted to acknowledge these two brothers, uh, especially, I get a lot of recognition. I don't know how much of it is deserved, but I try to pay, I try to acknowledge the ancestors and also uh, elders, the pioneers who paved the way. Here are two of my favorites. The taller, light complexion brother is Dr. Charles Finch. Dr. Finch, around 1981, 82 thereabouts, wrote an article called The African Background to Medical Science. And that was maybe the first time I'd read an article like that. And he's a physician, a retired physician. He lives in Atlanta. At one time, he was the dean, I believe, of the Morehouse School of Medicine. Bad brother, brilliant scholar, Dr. Charles S. Finch. And next to him is another brother who I like a whole lot who fits in. And this is Dr. Bernie Goldman. So we're talking about the African background to science and technology, including medical science. And then here's another one of Dr. Ch Finch. And here he's talking to Dr. Patricia Newton, who's an ancestor now, okay? I wanted to start with those and kind of bring their energy in and acknowledge them for what they have done. And here I am, here's your guide in the present. And here I am kicking it around in front of my computer. If not for uh, the virus, I, I would not be doing this. I'd be running around all over the place, hustling, lecturing, selling books. And now for better or for worse, I'm in my studio showing you photographs. All right. And here I am with another ancestral guide, of course. This is Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I'm with a statue of him. He used to say, if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. This is a statue of him in DC. Why is this important? Because he's considered to be the founder of Negro History Week, which I believe in 1976 became Black History Month. And it's never a bad thing to acknowledge the ancestors anyway. Speaking of ancestors, now, this is an important one and he fits right in. He'll be one of our ancestral guides, as I believe the dead don't die. Their spirit, their ideas, their vision run through us. And as long as that vision is alive, they are alive. This is the great Sheikh Anta Joke, the great African scholar from Senegal. But he was not only a scholar and a historian, he was also a scientist. You know, he wrote books like Pre-Colonial Black Africa, African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality. Of course, he wrote um, Cult Unity of Black Africa, many other books, but he was also a scientist. And I believe in 1960, after uh, working in Paris and doing research and lecturing and what have you, he returned to Africa and he set up a radiocarbon laboratory in Dakar, Senegal. I think that he would say African people don't run from science, run to it. Marcus Garvey said, we must develop a race of scientists second to none. African people were the first science scientists. And we could even say, 
that science began in Africa. I think that would be accurate here, Sheikh Antijopanis Laboratory. And I was able to visit that laboratory on my last trip to Africa, uh, just over a year ago. And I was able to take a group in this radiocarbon laboratory. Radiocarbon is what you use to, uh, or in a radiocarbon laboratory, you can date, as I understand it, organic matter. I'm not a scientist, I'm a historian, and I'm gonna take you through this chapter of our history. And here's a bust of Sheikh Antijope in that laboratory. And here's the laboratory itself. And I think that this may be the only one, I could be wrong, in Sub-Saharan Africa, all right? This is just a picture of the interior of the new museum in Dakar. There are at least three museums that are opening up. This one is already open. I understand that there's another one being planned for Benin in Nigeria. And then of course, I've been recently asked to be a member of the board of curators and academicians for the new, working on it, Pan-African Heritage World Museum, which will be in Accra. And that's a good thing. And we'll be able to house a lot of these artifacts on our, on our own. And also a lot of the pictures I'm gonna to show tonight are from the museums. Here's another one of our great scholars who made contributions, of course. Here I am many years ago with the great Ivan Van Sertema. A lot of us know Dr. Van Sertema for the book that came before Columbus, but perhaps the most important book that he edited in some ways, I think, is this book, uh, Blacks and Science, Ancient and Modern. And this was done way back in the early 1980s. Ivan wasn't just an author, he was an editor, much like myself, but even more so. And he was able to uh, bring together various scholars and compile their works in anthologies. And this is one of the most important ones. And of course, he also did works on Egypt, on Kemet, on Nile Valley civilization, and also on the Moors. I worked with him on all of those things. And I think we're gonna introduce some of all of that tonight. All right. My own book for children and beginners. And then let's look at some of the technology itself. Let's, let's go to the site. This, for example, is a place called Lion's Cavern. And this is in Swaziland in Southeast Africa. Africa has 54 sovereign nations. Swaziland is one of the countries in Southern Africa. It's very small, but they are renowned for two things in particular. One is called Lion's Cavern. That's the first that I'm aware of, mine in the world. I believe it's 43 or 47,000 years old, and they were mining, I believe, for ochre. And this is the photograph that I took of it. You couldn't get inside Lion's Cavern, but this is pretty close. And also something called the Labombo bone. The Labombo bone, to my knowledge, is the oldest known example of mathematics. It's, a, I think, a baboon bone, I believe. And they are not just carved on the surface of it in sequential order. This is 37,000 years old. That's how it's been dated from Swaziland. And so even at that point, Africans were engaged in some sort of rudimentary mathematics. Now, a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight is, in the, is from the museums. I'm the museum man. I think that there are enough artifacts in these museums to, in large measure, reconstruct the entire history of the African people, in large measure. And these are some of the museum pieces. This, for example, is an ancient African uh, fishing harpoon. This is from Central Africa. And I'm not sure how old this is. It's been estimated to be perhaps 90,000 years old. Understand that at this time, 90,000 years ago, African people were the only people. For much of the history of the world, African people, black people were the only people that existed. This is from Congo. And here are two of them. This is in the uh, Natural History Museum in the, um, Natural History Museum or the Museum of Science in Brussels, Belgium. And then here's maybe the most interesting aspect of that museum. You have another little bone. This is called the Ashango bone. And perhaps this is the one carved of bamboo. I'm not sure. Maybe both of them are. And here you have notches, as I pointed out with the Labombo bone, but this one I've seen carved on the bone in sequential order. And on the top of it is a little piece of quartz. 
So it may well have been used as a writing implement as well. This is 25,000 years old. And I'm told, although I have not seen them with my own eyes, that there are others in the Central African Museum in um, just outside of Brussels, Belgium, even older than this. Now, math was the class I had the most difficulty with all the time. I wonder, I could be wrong, but I wonder how my attitude about mathematics and myself would have been affected had I known that Black folk, African people, my ancestors were the first known mathematicians. All right. Now, this is something different. Forgive me, let me hydrate here. I'm told it's very important. This is um, an astronomical observatory and it's called Nopta Playa. And I believe it was found, I don't know if it was on the Sudanese side or the Egyptian side of the border. And it's an ancient astronomical observatory. Now it has been moved into the courtyard of the um, Nubian Museum in Aswan, Egypt. It's at least twice as old as Stonehenge. The stones are placed in, um, uh, in a significant order, all right, not the playa. Now this is, with what looks like locks, this is uh, King Djoser, or Zoser. He comes to us from the third dynasty or third royal family of Kemet, and he is important to us because during this time, the first known um, large stone building in the world is erected, okay? And it's called the Step Pyramid. You can see why it would be called that. Now we're at about 4,650 years ago. We are in the Nile Valley, we are in Kemet, we are in ancient Egypt. This monument was built as a tomb for King Djoser in the third dynasty the beginning of the pyramid age by none other than Imhotep. Surely, if you haven't heard of any Africans, there are about three that, that I guess everybody's heard of, maybe didn't know they were African. King Tut, Tutankhamun, obviously, Ramses the Great, and Imhotep. Imhotep, unlike the other two, was not a king. He was just a bad brother. He's a multi-genius. Before we hear about Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, and Albert Einstein and Isaac Newton, there was an African who foreshadowed, foreshadowed all of them. He's also considered the father of medicine, but he designed this building. He was a dentist and a writer and a scribe. In fact, there's the brother right there. Let's look at Imhotep with those big Barack Obama ears. The more you could hear, the more you would know, and the more you knew, the more power you would possess. Imhotep became something of a legendary kind of figure. His name means he who comes in peace or the man of peace. And he lived alongside King Djoser and other great um, scientists and, and um, uh, physicians at that time. There's another one, uh, I don't know why I didn't include it, a brother named Hesse Ray, who was a chief of dentists and surgeons. I'm talking nearly 4,700 years ago. So this is Imhotep in the form of a scribe, a writer, later generations of African writers before they would write something, they would spill ink in the ground and ask themselves rhetorically, could there ever be another like Imhotep? Now, this is Imhotep's mama. So if you had any doubt about Imhotep himself and his racial affinities, his identity, let's rest that. This is the mother of Imhotep. Her name is Kordonk, and I've shown these before, and you can see the comparisons. Sister Makeda, Empress Makeda kind of looks like you. This sister from the Omo Valley in Ethiopia. I don't think we talk about Kemet too much. I just think we need to do a better job connecting Kemet with the rest of Africa. That's what I'm trying to do. And here's another one. This is a Hamar woman from the Omo Valley of Southern Ethiopia. Beautiful sister, I think. And one more time. Now let's just go through Egyptian history, Nile Valley history, Kemetic history. And let's look at some of the pyramid builders and the technology and science they're associated with. This is King Huni, and he's responsible for this pyramid. Now this comes after the step pyramid, and we don't know, at least I don't know, the name of this particular, uh, the engineer or the architect who designed this. This is at a place called Maydoom, and it's one of my favorite places to go. And one of the reasons I like it so much is because very few people actually go there, all right. And there, there's a close-up, 
And inside one of those tomb chambers, this is another early king associated with pyramid building. This is King uh, Sneferu. And this is one of his pyramids. Some people say he had three pyramids. He had at least two. And this is the first so-called true or classic pyramids. What can we point out already? These weren't built by slaves. It took some serious scientists to work this out, okay? And they are the wonders of the ancient world. This is King Khufu with this happy to be nappy hairstyle. And his, this is his pyramid. And this is called Khufu on the horizon, better known as the Great Pyramid. This is 2.3 million blocks of hard granite stone came from about 500 miles away or hundreds of miles away. And that stone would be cut and loaded on a barge and sailed down the Nile. That took some organization to do that. And then when they, and then it's, it's made up of 2.3 million blocks of hard granite stone, average weight of which is about 5,000 pounds. And it wasn't cemented together. It was uh, fitted together. Like you would fit the stones like the pieces of a puzzle and then covered with limestone. I'm told you can see it from outer space. I don't know who, um, I, anyway, I haven't seen it from outer space, but that's what I'm told. The Arabs who came uh, and saw this uh, used to say, the world fears time, but time fears the pyramids. Napoleon estimated that if you broke this monument down to one quarter foot cubes, it was stretched two thirds of the way around the world. So this is pretty impressive and it wasn't built by slaves. These were national construction projects. Next to that uh, pyramid, Khufu on the horizon called the Great Pyramid is what is called the Pyramid Ship. Now this was a wooden ship, 120 feet long that was taken apart and put um, and stacked up. It's made of cedar wood with instructions left as to how to reassemble it and it was found in there. It's been estimated that it could sail today if they made an effort. This is the world's oldest best preserved ship and it came out of here. This is the original pit. It was 30 meters long. I don't know how much that is in feet, 120 feet. It was covered with 41 large stone blocks of limestone weighing about 18 tons. 4.5 meters long, 1.80 meters high, and 80 feet and 80, 85 centimeters thick. The dismantled parts of the boat, it had been placed in 13 layers. 1,224 wooden pieces were found inside the pit with instructions as to how to reassemble it. Now that's really something. And it was uh, uh, detected, I believe in 1955. And then here are the two biggest pyramids on the Giza Plateau together. One is the Great Pyramid, I better start going faster. And then it's the Pyramid of Khufu's son, Khafre. Here I am standing in front of the Great Pyramid. And here's a view from near the top. And here's a view looking down, 480 some feet high, okay, 48 stories, sitting on 13 acres. Now we don't need to build another pyramid, but it's nice to know that we have the capabilities of doing great things. This is just a fragment of the face of Khafre, who had this one built. And we know uh, his pyramid because the limestone has remained on top. Now, this one, this is a reconstruction, obviously. This is probably what they actually look like. So you have the granite core and then limestone placed on the outside, and they would buff it and shine it until it was like glass until it was like a mirror. Now imagine something 486 feet high, sitting on 13 acres, there are no clouds in the sky and the sun came up and that's what African people did. That's what African scientists did. And why do you think everybody wants to take Egypt out of Africa? Modern Egyptology began at the height of the transatlantic slave trade. When Africans are being taken out of Africa by the hundreds of thousands, if not millions every year, to make a slave, you must take away their history, their sense of self-worth. And we know these were black people. We even have, in some cases, their nicknames. Sisters and brothers had nicknames like BB and Mimi and DD. You know we're talking about black people. Kafra yeah. again, who also, it is believed, had the space carved in his own likeness, Horamakit. 
This is Menkar Ray in the center of the third of the great pyramid builders. And one of the things about him is that he also had pyramids for his queens. A lot of people are not aware that some of the sisters have pyramids as well. And these are all on the Giza Plateau. Pyramids of the queens of Menkare. Now over a period of time, those pyramids weren't affected. The, effective. the purpose of building a pyramid to begin with was to be a resting place for the monarch and his family. But something that big obviously is gonna attract a lot of attention and people started to break in. So they began to build other tombs. And this is one of those tombs from the fifth dynasty. Let's go quick. By the 18th dynasty, about 1550 BC, you have uh, another set of kings. For example, this brother's name is Tutmos I and this is his daughter, uh, Makare Hatshepsut, one of the female pharaohs. And, th and this is from an expedition they did to a place called the Land of Punt in East Africa. In order to get there, they had to have these ships and these were the Marines on the ships. So it also causes us to look at the role of African people in shipping and navigation. And this is a temple that was carved for Hatshepsut. But what I wanted to bring attention to is during this time in particular, they began to erect these massive phallic symbols, these monuments that the world calls obelisk or Tekken. And these were victory monuments. They would inscribe, the kings would just, just inscribe the great deeds of their reign there. But they were also a kind of clock. You could tell what time of day it was by the shadow caused by the reflection of the sun. These are carved out of single pieces of stone. And this is the brother who is responsible for the ones you just saw. He worked under Hapshetsut. And here's another one. This one is actually a thousand tons and they abandoned it in the quarry because there was a crack in it. They wanted it to be perfect. How would they move these monuments? What was the technology that was employed to move these massive monuments and erect them in the important places of Kemet? Some of them have been taken out of Africa. You can find them today in Paris, in Istanbul, in Rome, in London. And you can see that they influence the construction of Washington, D.C. One of my brothers, Tony Browder, actually does a tour called Egypt on the Potomac. The founding fathers of America, Rosicrucians and Masons, were very much influenced by Egypt, ancient Egypt. They may not have acknowledged that the ancient Egyptians were African, but they were certainly profoundly influenced by Egypt itself. And Washington, D.C. reflects that even the reflection pool is probably based on this sacred lake in Karnak Temple. Here are two monuments from the 18th dynasty. These are interesting. They are called the Colossi of Memnon. And they are important to us because this was, these are statues in front of the mortuary temple of the powerful King Amenhotep III. Why is it here? Because one of these statues every morning at sunrise was known to make a whistling or singing sound. How did they work that? What kind of technology did they know about to, to produce an effect like that? I think it came from this statue right here. And this was testified to for hundreds of years. Here's another interesting thing about Kemet. The word Kemet apparently is the basis for the word chemi chemical and chemistry. And they knew something about the chemical composition of paint. One of the things you're struck by when you're in the tombs and the temples is how bright and vivid the colors still are even now, thousands of years after they were originally painted. So what about that? The chemical composition of the paint, and of course this is in Tutankhamun's tomb, and even the, the issue of metallurgy. Look at the beautiful gold mask of Tutankhamun, thousands of years old. These were not slaves, these were not dummies, these were brilliant people, they were geniuses, and it runs in our DNA. And there, of course, this suit's uncommon, actually in his tomb. Okay. Again, just the bright, vivid colors. Now, here's an interesting piece, and you can make of it what you will. This is in the temple of at Abydos of Seti I and Ramses the Great. And if you look closely, you will, in fact, let's go back. 
Now this, if you can see the cursor, looks like a helicopter. And this, I don't know, kind of looks like a submarine. And look at this object right here. Of course, there are many opinions about it. I'm told they just barely damaged hieroglyphs, but that's what they look like. Here's an interesting piece. I love to talk about black women. I love to elevate them and lift them up. And this is an image of a female aspect of God called Sheshat. Sheshat was kind of an accountant and a scientist in her own right. She's the significant other of the figure called Jehuti, who the Greeks called Thoth. And it is believed that's where the term thought comes from. Imagine that. Even the word thought itself is derived from Africa. Anyway, this is his significant other. I say, what good is a king without a queen? And you can always tell her because it's a, she's in the form of a woman with a star over her head. Her name is Sheshat. And one of the things, one of the titles she has, and I absolutely love it, she is called the mistress of the house of books. The mistress of the house of books. She would be identified as the world's first librarian. Hey. Ramses the Great. Now, Ramses is a great builder. And one of the temples he's associated with is this magnificent temple at Abu Simbel. It's 60 feet high. And it is probably what inspired Mount Rushmore. Here you have four African kings, actually uh, four of the same kings, Ramses the Great. Now we're at about 3,300 years ago and four American presidents. He's also, he also has these Tekken or obelisk painted black. These are canopic jars. And one of the most interesting things about Kemet or Egypt is mummification and the preservation of the body. And the body would be embalmed. But before you did that, you would take out the internal organs of the deceased, the heart, the liver, the lungs, the intestines, and you would place them in these various jars that represented the four cardinal directions of the earth. So Africans had to have some knowledge of anatomy. I've already mentioned Imhotep. Now at this particular temple, a place called Kanambo, you actually have depictions of medical instruments. Here, I believe, is a stethoscope. And if you look down here, you can see others, Africans in medical science. And here's another interesting piece. This apparently is the way they gave birth. This is a depiction of Aset or Isis. And you can see more medical instruments over here. And here she is giving birth. And you can see how that was done. Here is a depiction of Imhotep. You can't see it. And more images of Aset on a birthing stool. And then here you can actually see the baby coming out. Look at the detail. This is at the temple of Kanambo. African metallurgy. Look at this beautiful golden piece. This is from Nubia. Nubia was called the land of gold. Let me pick up the pace. More of Imhotep and Imhotep's mother. Here's an interesting piece. And there's an article about this in the book, Blacks and Science, edited by Ivan Van Sertema. And there have been other articles about it. This is what some people say is a model of a bird and other people say it's a model of a glider. It's about 300 BC. It's found as a card near the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser. This was in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And in the so-called Arab Spring of 10 years ago, the museum was broken into. Only a handful of pieces disappeared, and this was one of them. Some people. Some scientists, I believe even from NASA, believe that this is an ancient glider. Long before the Wright brothers were a twinkle in anybody's eye, Africans, according to these scholars, were engaged in some level of flight. This is a mathematician that accompanied me on one of my tours 10 years ago. I've been to Egypt 25 times. God willing, I'll go back in August of this year with a group. This is Dr. Adulahim Shabazz, he trained most of the African-American PhD mathematicians. So let's quickly look at some other parts of Africa and wind it up. For example, this is the church of St. George. This is where his Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I 
was coronated emperor of Ethiopia. And this church is carved out of the earth. The local people say it wasn't built by human beings. They say it was built by angels. Here it is right here. In Southeast Africa, the remains of great Zimbabwe, you have these, a series of stone cities. So my point is that civilization in Africa was not confined to the Nile Valley, it was continent wide. This takes us to Mali. And in the mountains here live a group of people called the Dogon. The Dogon are important to us because they are stargazers. They have a profound knowledge of astronomy. For example, they know about Sirius B. Sirius B is what is called a white dwarf, a star that is imploded upon itself. They know about its orbital patterns. And they've been knowing it for hundreds of years before Western science became aware of Sirius B. And these are the Dogon, D-O-G-O-N. If you want to do further research, the two classic works are uh, The Pale Fox by a, a French anthropologist named Marcel Griole, G-R-I-A-U-L-E, Grioli, The Pale Fox, and the other book, it's called Conversations with Olga Tomelli, also by Marcel Griot. And Olga Tomelli apparently was a Dogon elder who talked about the history and the lore and the worldview of the Dogon. Here's a Dogon sister looking real serious as if to say, Renoko, is this the best you got? Come on, step it up. And then another one of Sirius B. Here I am in Niger with what are called the Niger manuscripts, hundreds of years old, written in Arabic and Songhoi. And some of these manuscripts talk about uh, African science and scientists, and including astronomy. This one takes us to Europe. This is in the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University. This is a depiction of Andromeda. Who is Andromeda? According to the Greeks, Andromeda was the son, was the daughter, sorry about that. Andromeda was the daughter of the king and queen of Ethiopia. For the Greeks, the word Ethiopia meant the land of the burnt faced people. And I think it referred particularly to what is now the Sudan as opposed to what is the current country of Ethiopia. Anyway, they thought she was an Ethiopian princess, a black princess. And she married Perseus, and they produced a child called Perseus. Of course, Perseus is the person in Greek mythology who slew the Medusa. Why am I putting this here? Because the Andromeda galaxy is named after her. Tell that to the world, that the Andromeda galaxy is named after a Black woman. I love that. Here, as we begin to leave Africa, is something also that Dr. Finch shared from the work of a Scottish uh, surgeon named Felkin. And here is a Caesarian section being formed, I mean, being performed in Uganda late in the uh, 18th century, before this was happening in Europe. So even at that time, even with the advent of the transatlantic slave trade, African, in African involvement in science and technology is still worthy. Now here's where I get in trouble with a lot of folks that want to George Floyd me. When I talk about the African background to the Olmec civilization, I'm not going to stop. And I ask you the question, do these look like the features of a black person? If they don't, we can just stop talking. If they do, okay, let's go on. Now this is called El Rey. Why am I, why am I including it here? Because I think the Africans who came and entered into the Olmec world, hear me now, I'm not saying Olmec civilization was an African civilization. I want everybody to be clear on this. I am convinced that Olmec civilization was an indigenous civilization, but that at a certain time in Olmec history, a small group of Africans appeared and they had a profound impact on that civilization. And that is what I believe these heads commemorate. This is El Rey. I think one of the things that these Africans might have done was introduce the ability to move large objects in stone. It's also a fact that the first pyramid in the Americas is an Olmec pyramid at a place called Aventa. All right, so the Olmec. 
stirring the pot. This is Mayan. I don't think anybody has significantly looked at the role of black people among the Maya or the image of the black. If these are not black people, what does the black color symbolize? Sometimes blackness can be ethnic. Sometimes it can be symbolic. Sometimes it can be metaphysical or esoteric. So what does it mean? If it's not a black person, what is the significance of the color black in the Mayan world? And the Mayans we know were advanced scientists. Almost done. And then this broke it all up. The transatlantic slave trade, which made a lot of us forget that we had a history before slavery. So a lot of people not transfixed. They're locked into the slavery room. As long as you can find, according to these folk, as long as you can find yourself to slavery, as long as you are only talking about Chicken George, as long as you are talking about Black people only in the realms of music and entertainment and athletics, you're good. But when you step out of that lane, you've got trouble. And I consistently step out of that lane. I invite good trouble as John Lewis said, because we are going to talk about the history of African people from an African perspective. And we're not gonna whisper, and we're not gonna stutter, and we're not going to stammer, and most of all, we are not going to apologize. As Muda Maruka said, slavery is not African history. Slavery interrupted African history. That was one of the beautiful things about the film Black Panther. It showed a vision of what Africa could have been. And one of the primary stars in that was a young African scientist, a sister. They never used the N word. They never used the B word. Sisters with natural hair. It was beautiful. All right, transatlantic slave trade. So we're gonna wind down. On Saturday, we're gonna look at African-American scientists. We're going to look at contributions to science by Black folk in the Americas, like, for example, the marine biologist Ernest Everett Just. And we will look at the life of Dr. Charles Drew and his work on blood plasma. And we will look especially at George Washington Carver. All of these men follow in the footsteps of Hesse Ray and Cinemut and Imhotep. Remember, our history does not begin in chains, it will not end in chains, never forget that. And that our ancestors paid a tremendous price for us to be able to speak out against injustice. We don't have the right to be silent. If you really want a full dose of the Nile Valley, I invite you to partake in my monthly Global African Presence webinar. They're always the last Friday and the last Saturday of every month. This time we're gonna to return to the Nile Valley and we're gonna specifically look at the first national liberation struggle in Africa, the attempt to expel the Hiskos. And then we're gonna look at the 18th dynasty of Hapshetsut and Amos Nefertari and Tutankhamun and Queen Tai and Akhenaten. And then we're gonna look at the Ramesside dynasty, dynasty 19. If you want the information, just go to Eventbrite and type in Renoco or go to my website, drrenoco.com or email me after the show at renoco at hotmail.com. Remember this Saturday, we're going to do part two. We're gonna celebrate black scientific achievement in the Americas. So you don't wanna miss that. But tonight I think we have covered a whole lot and I didn't got all pumped up and let's see if Empress Makeda wants to say something here. <laughs> Thank you, Baba. It was yeah. incredible because I'm really, I'm really happy that you chose to, to go back in time that we, it wasn't just in America, Africans in America, you know, to go back and to know that we were scientists uh, in ancient Kemet in, in Egypt which is Kemet, we're comedic people. So, and then I, I'm so happy that you talked about the star Sirius, which was discovered in, I think, um, 19, 
probably 20s or 30s. And the, not, not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Not that long ago. And the Dogun, they knew about that star, those two stars, because there's Ama and the red star and the, the blue star. It's right there. I don't know why anybody, you can see it. I look at it. It's rising. This, this is the time it rises in, uh, in the winter. And it's right in the front door of the World Beat Center and uh, the Blue Star and, and the Hopis knew about it, you know? That's why they got Kachinas, the, the Blue Star, Kachinas. So I'm so happy you talked about, uh, I love the Dogun people. When you come to the World Beat Center, you can see the Dogun, uh, you know, the mural and the star, and they feel that they brought water to the earth, you know? So in Mali, we might have to take that trip up there you know, oh, also time. with you, because they're very, very unusual. And I heard that they're descendants of uh, ancient Egyptian, and they took the knowledge to Mali, because they said also that um, Isis, the queen, Aset, used to, her altar was uh, affixed to the star Sirius. So... And then they also invented the, the ephemeris and the solar calendar that we have on the wall at the World Beat Center. So for uh, the Greeks and Romans did not invent that calendar. And we see African skies different. So that's why I love cultural astronomy. And that's what we're writing about. And that'll be in our newsletter. And it's only 1% of astronomers that are African American and one percent that 1%. is Latin American. One. Wow. And zero percent Native American mm. astronomers. And uh, and you know it's cultural astronomy. So it's it's very interesting because so we want all of you to look up at the stars. You can get you can get it on your phone and you can see where the star Sirius is and the Pallades, which the, the Mayan temples were, you know, pointing to the Pallades. They're so interesting, the Pallades, the five sisters or something. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. And these cats do this. That's why it's on Saburu. You see those stars in the Saburu? Those are the Pallades and also Mercedes Benz. I mean, that's a heavy, that, that, un, that, star that on the Mercedes Benz, that's really heavy. Because um, the German really uh, studied uh, the ephemeris and, and, and astrology too. Well, so you, know, you know, sis, listening to you and having done a little research, you know, I had to bone up. I had to put a lot of work into this. This isn't normally a presentation I give. But I learned a lot and I realized how much I don't know, how we've really just kind of scratched the surface as far as African contributions to the world in science. If we wanted to, we could do it in art or music or virtually anything. You know, I would say that for the most part, the history of African people has not been told. And you know why? Because we haven't told it. So it's up to us to do that. And I would, I might add, that uh, I can go outside and look at a star, or I can just look directly at you and see a star. And I'm comfortable <laughs> with both of those. You too, Bob. I love you very much. And you it's, too. It's, it's so incredible to, to know our story because that's why we have to have teachers like you, Baba, so we can know our history. And Marcus Garvey said the people without the knowledge of their history is like a tree planted without its roots. So this is our roots to know our culture and to know, you know, where we came from and where we're going. And it's our story, not his story. And uh, so I'm really, you know, I salute the scientists, you know, all the scientists holding on to the truth. You know what else too? is no doubt that some of those scientists were kidnapped and snatched up in the Mahafa. 
And so a lot of that science was taken to the American. You know, one of the people I'll have to look at at least a little bit for Saturday, I'm gonna have to get myself together, is Benjamin Banneker. Oh. Because he's another important person. And there's an argument that he actually has Dogon roots. And yes, it is said that the Dogon did migrate from the Nile Valley to their current place in Mali. So there's so much history and it's very exciting and it's good to be excited. I love what I do and I love being challenged to do more. So thank you for having me. I'm gonna thank get you. together for Saturday. I better start studying right now because I don't want to drop the ball, you know. So thank you, my sister. If there are any questions or anything you want to share, otherwise I just I'll say thank you and and bid you. <laughs> bid you. Is there any questions? Do you, do you have any questions out there that you want to uh, ask Dr. Runak or Ashidi? There are no questions. That sounds good to me. So let me get, <laughs> let me get myself together for Saturday. All right. Let me just say this and I'm out of here. It's an honor to talk about the history of African people. And I enjoy it and sometimes I inject a little humor, but it's an honor and a privilege and it's really a sacred duty and, and mission. And I feel grateful to be able to do what I do. So my sister, thank you. Thank the World Beat Center. And uh, again, if anybody wants to contact me, Renoco at hotmail.com. My website is drrenoco.com. Don't forget the Eventbrite webinar, just type in Renoco. So blessed love, Empress. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Talk to you Plus soon. 11. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for educating us about our people. And, you know, and I, and I want to say that, you know, I was with the Hopis and the Hopis knew about the Omecas. You know, they say they came up with them, the Hopi state. I mean, that's why we have to know our true history. The, the Hopis are very secret, secretive. Uh, but I was able to, to be there with them. And also the Dogun tribe is very secretive, you know, so uh, read and study and all this. And so we can know the truth. And, and I'm so happy that you are teaching that truth. Thank you a lot, Asante Asana and Hotep.
Don't be going to my tea.